Welcome to episode 52 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery, recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and I'm once again joined by Josh Fields of the Libertarian Apothecary. We are deviating from our standard format to discuss President Biden's recent speech on gun violence and his plan to address it. With that, let's get right into it. Good morning, Josh. Morning, DL. How are you doing today, buddy? Very well. To folks out there, we normally record more in the afternoon today because we had a bit of an issue with our last recording. That would be my fault. We are recording once again, and it is now not not even 930 in the morning. So we may stammer and stumble as this caffeine kicks in. So we'll see how that works out. Um, <laughs> got you. He's got the Mountain Dew. I've got coffee in my dad cup. Let me see Excellent. everybody here. See Papa DL right there. Papa DL. That's right. right. Yeah, this is the cup my wife got me when our son was born. So today we're going to be talking about President Biden's speech. We're also going to include Vice President Harris, who gave a few minutes. Uh, she, she spoke for a few minutes before President Biden did. And this was the speech that they gave, let's see, I believe Thursday afternoon. Um, at the Rose Garden. And this is the one where they're talking about some of the things that they're going to do to help curb what he's calling the epidemic of gun violence. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start start right away. We're going to play this clip from Kamala Harris. And then after that, we will go ahead and just discuss it and, 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 and see what kind of thoughts that we have. You know, who knows? You might be surprised. Maybe Josh and I will agree with them, but I doubt it. Over the course of my career, I have seen gun violence up close. I've looked at autopsy photographs. I've seen with my own two eyes what a bullet can do to the human body. I've held hands with the hands of parents who have lost a child. I have seen children who were traumatized by the loss of a parent or sibling. And I have fought my entire career to end this violence and to pass reasonable gun safety laws. Time and again, as progress has stalled, we have all asked, what are we waiting for? Because we aren't waiting for a tragedy, I know that. We've had more tragedy than we can bear. We aren't waiting for solutions either, because the solutions exist. They already exist. People on both sides of the aisle want action. Real people on both sides of the aisle want action. So all that is left is the will and the courage to act. And President Joe Biden has the will and the courage to act. As a United States Senator, Joe Biden took on the gun lobby not once but twice, and he won. In 1993, he worked to pass the Brady Handgun Violation Prevention Act. This law established a background check system and has kept more than three million firearms out of the hands of dangerous people. A year later, he worked to pass another law to ban assault weapons and high-capacity magazines for 10 years. And as Vice President, Joe Biden led the Obama-Biden administration's efforts to reduce gun violence. In fact, we were just reminiscing that he and I talked back then about his work, because I was Attorney General at the time of California. And his work resulted in nearly two dozen actions from narrowing the gun show loophole to expanding funding for mental health services. And as you will hear in a moment, President Joe Biden is a leader with great will, great determination, and even greater empathy. 
He has seen the grief of all of those who have lost a loved one to gun violence. It is for them, for all of us, that he will never, ever give up. All right. So let's talk about that. You know, the first thing that I noticed, and I didn't notice this the last time when we were trying to record, is that Kamala Harris, uh, President, uh, Vice President Harris, talks about how he took on the gun lobby twice in one. And then she also kind of lists all these accolades and says, okay, well, he created this, he did this, he did that, he did that. But at no point in that three minutes does she say, this action that he took led to this reduction in deaths. Mm -hmm. There was nothing concrete mm -hmm. there for the American people. It was just, I did this, I did that. And it's, you know, it, it might, for people that maybe work in corporate America or an office, it may be, it may feel very similar to somebody who says, well, I put in place all these things. And then the workers outside are like, didn't really help us any. I mean, yeah. it's great for you guys. Maybe you got some better metrics out of it. You got some, you know, better data that you could support, show your managers, but it didn't really help us who are actually working. And I, I feel like that was very similar to, you know, what I just heard is that she's telling us all these things that he did, but there was no benefit to the American people. And we're the ones that she's saying are suffering. Yeah. No, she didn't. Um, <clears throat> she didn't really uh, provide any statistics or data on any of those things. Um, let me um, let, let me just kind of start this out because we're going to review Kamala, obviously, and then we're going to go into what Biden said. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to, um, you know, to to lay the the foundation uh, with how for the viewers with how I feel, and I, I'm pretty sure you, you feel pretty much the same way I do about um, the rights and our constitution. But um, mm -hmm. you know, my my initial reaction anytime like because I I've been even long before I was a libertarian, I've been uh, I understood the right the um, how should I say this? The importance of the Second Amendment and the importance of uh, having the ability to defend yourself. Uh, so, like, I feel like here we go again. Uh, you know, we're having the same the same type of argument over over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, um, Kamala did a good job with what she was supposed to be doing. She was teeing you up emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, she um, mentioned the autopsies. She mentioned all these personal connections with people. Um, she used a lot of the political rhetoric that I always like to refer to. Uh, there's a um, a book uh, called Rhetoric by Kenneth Burke. Um, it's almost like a playbook for um, for how to deceive and manipulate uh, through wordplay. Um, so having the courage to act is what she's saying. So implying everyone else doesn't have courage. So she did her job. She didn't. She didn't put much information into it. But let me let me just say to start this conversation with these uh, uh, with the government with these people on this is you have to assume. Uh, that the Constitution is the rights granted by the government to us. And right off the bat, that's a, um, uh, that's a fallacy right off the bat. Um, the, the Constitution was written so um, these, at least the, the Bill of Rights was, uh, it was written in such a manner that um, those are the areas that the government is to not tread upon. This is where the government does not have authority. They don't have the ability to regulate these things. That doesn't mean that here, we, the government gave you the Second Amendment so you can own firearms. Firearms is your natural right. Right. The Second Amendment just recognizes that natural right and says that the government can't tread on that. Now, th that's, that's a fundamental difference in how you read the Constitution. The mm -hmm. rights provided to you. N nobody provided you rights. The rights were um, natural, uh, they already exist. The Constitution is just recognizing those rights. So I just want to be clear because starting off the bat, and there, there's the other thing too, we have to assume uh, by them talking about what Biden's saying, we have to assume that the existing orders that we have, uh, the standard we already have are constitutional. Mm -hmm. um, now, some of you out there are probably like, well, yeah, this has been through the court system. They found it constitutional. Um, if you spend very much time listening to me talk or probably DL too. I don't think most of the laws we have on our book are constitutional. We have an activist judiciary. They don't interpret the constitution in its original text. They right. reimagine it 
and uh, I, I don't support that. So I, I just want to be clear, like moving forward, I, I want to talk about what plans that they have, but our initial starting point is already as far beyond where we should already be. Um, so I, I just want that to be clear. Uh, but as, as far as uh, Kamala goes, she talked about the emotions. I want to go back into that because mm-hmm. that's, that's what it is. It's, she's trying to come from a, a vantage point of superiority. I, I, I have seen autopsies with my own eyes. Um, I mentioned to you before, I mean, I, I've seen all this stuff too. I, I've worked some in trauma. Uh, I've seen gunshot wounds. I've seen people get shot as well. Um, it is not a pretty sight. She's trying to she's trying to bring the human element into it, which is completely fine. And we should do that on things except politics. Right. Um, right. You know, emotion is not a place for that. Gun violence is absolutely a terrible thing. So it, that, that's really about the only thing I could agree with her on uh, on that, you know, especially if it's unwarranted violence. And I think we're going to break that down a little bit later. The difference between uh, justified and unjustified violence. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we're definitely going to get into that. Yeah, yeah. we got a lot. We, we, we got a lot to talk about, folks. So, uh, you know, with this topic, you know, we could probably spend hours and we don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, but it's hard not to because there's so much to talk about. I mean, I was just reading last night. I was kind of going back and kind of just perusing through uh, DC v, uh, versus Heller and then reading some of the stuff that was prior to that. I was reading a few other things. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not going to get into those, yeah. uh, but I think they're very relevant to the conversation. And uh, I might I might pull out a couple of things that I discovered that seem to be pretty interesting, but we'll see when we get there. You know, one of the things that I pointed out, in the, uh, you, you know, one of the things I want to point out is that uh, Her- Vice President Harris points, she, she says, I've seen what a bullet can do to a body. Yeah. And I think One of the things when Josh is saying, hey, we want to start with this kind of foundation, the other foundation that we want to start with is that gun violence includes violence from police when police shoot somebody. Sometimes it is warranted. Sometimes it is not. And the same goes with civilians. Sometimes it is warranted. Sometimes it is not. If I go to a a bank and I try to rob them and I shoot the teller, that is not warranted violence. But if somebody breaks into my home and threatens my wife and my child and I shoot them, that is very warranted. Yes. Both of them, however, will be considered gun violence. The mm-hmm. same holds true for the police. If the police are called to a domestic violence scene, they're called on a domestic, they get there, the husband's you know, trashing his wife, they, they go to grab him off, and then he tries to maybe stab the officer and the officer ends up shooting him. That's justified, right? Just based on that scenario, uh, yeah. because he's committing an act of aggression against somebody else. And then he turns his aggression towards the officer. He's not relenting. So therefore the officer is put in a position where he has to shoot them. If the officer, if an officer shows up, uh, maybe they pull you over on the side of the road and he gets a little aggressive and he thinks that you move your hand too quickly and he shoots you. Now, I know that sometimes they'll say that was warranted. I would say that's not justified, right? Because it was shooting, you know, without a a clear need to defend oneself, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and we'll assume for the moment that once the facts of that particular story come out, that it's pretty obvious that it wasn't really as threatening of a situation. I know that those kind of stories get a little bit murky. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is that in all four of these cases, gun violence. So when we talk about gun violence, we're talking about a wide range of incidents. And we really do need to tease out which ones are warranted, which ones are not. And if we can't do that, then anytime we talk about gun violence and we say this gun violence has got to stop, we're actually including justified shootings. And we need to be very, very careful because we're taking this perception. If we say, hey, gun violence is out of control, well, is it? Because once we remove all the justified ones, how many unjustified shootings do we actually have? And I may I may even try to pull up a, an interesting z- statistic here in a minute um, as we're uh, as, as we you know, once we get into it a little bit. I think uh, actually suicides are included in that, too. Uh, they are. They are. And, and uh, President Biden does mention them uh, when he's speaking. He, he, yeah, he talks about those. 
Uh, but these are all part of the conversation. And so these are things that we need to be aware of and we need to determine, is it appropriate to say gun violence and include all of them? Uh, if not, and I think not, then which ones should we include? And then how should we, uh, how, how should we determine what, what, which ones we talk about? And then from there, the, you know, and this is an uncomfortable conversation for anybody is to, is to determine what is acceptable. Now, the reality is zero deaths should be what we're aiming for, right? That should be the goal. But we also have to speak on a practical side. There are 330, you know, roughly 330 uh, million Americans in this country. And some of them are going to get out of control. Some of them will shoot somebody or commit violence against somebody else in some way. Some of them will have violence committed against them in defense. And these are, you know, and, and so we have to say, all right, rather than think of it maybe in terms of what's acceptable, think of it in terms of what is reasonable to expect with this many million Americans and the way that people act. What is the expectation that we should have? And this is a, that's part of the conversation that we never have. And, and it may be, a, you know, it may be that we can't come to a number like that. Um, you know, because I, I would think that's very difficult. Like, how do you determine like this many, this many unjustified shootings is about what we should expect? Well, I would want to expect zero, mm -hmm. but I know that's not reasonable. Yeah. Any other thoughts or we want to move on to Biden? Um, just the last thing I, I just I, I just want to reiterate. She she was just using the rhetoric. She was bringing it. She didn't really bring any substance. Obviously, she didn't talk about any of the executive orders. She was teeing you up emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I just want to want to caution everybody out there. Anytime you're watching politicians, whatever your background is, you have to filter out the noise. And I'm not trying to sound inhuman here, but the noise is the emotion. OK, and and because they, they get you set on a certain like you feel empathetic or sympathetic for, for people or the victims of gun violence. So you become more likely to comply or acquiesce to whatever kind of plans they have to solve it. So uh, try to think objectively whenever you're looking at these things, too. So that's it. That's all I want to say. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get into that Biden clip. And we're going to play, well, we're going to play it in six parts. We're going to play the very first part of it where he's kind of introducing, um, you, you know, just kind of getting his momentum going. And then he's got five items that he wants to tackle. And we're going to talk about each one of those separately. So let's get that video playing. You know, we're joined today by the Attorney General, Eric Garland, who I've asked to uh, prioritize gun violence. It's also good to see the second gentleman who is here, and uh, it's good to see the First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, who cares deeply about this issue as well. And I look out there and I see so many members of Congress who've led in this fight, so many of you who've never given up, so many of you are in, can, absolutely determined, as Murph and, and others are, to get this done. We've got a long way to go. It seems like we always have a long way to go. But I also, uh, today, we're taking steps to confront not just the gun crisis, but what is actually a public health crisis. Nothing, nothing I'm about to recommend in any way impinges on the Second Amendment. There are phony arguments suggesting that these are Second Amendment rights at stake from what we're talking about. But no amendment, no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. You can't yell crowd, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. We call a freedom of speech. From the very beginning, you couldn't own any weapon you wanted to own. From the very beginning, of the Second Amendment existed. Certain people weren't allowed to have weapons. So the idea is just bizarre to suggest that some of the things we're recommending are contrary to the Constitution. Gun violence in this country is an epidemic. Let me say it again. Gun violence in this country is an epidemic, and it's an international embarrassment. You know, we saw it again last night as I was coming to the Oval Office. I got the word that uh, in South Carolina, a, uh, a physician uh, with his wife, two grandchildren, and a person working at his house was gunned down, all five. So many people, so many of the people sitting here today know that well, unfortunately. 
You know, uh, they know what it's like when the seconds change your life forever. I've had the pleasure of getting to meet in awful circumstances. Many of you, many of you who've lost your children, your husbands, your wives, you know, uh, they know what it's like to bury a piece of their soul deep in the earth. We understand that. Mark and, uh, and Jackie, I want to tell you, uh, it's always good to see you, but not under these circumstances. I want to say, before I introduce the rest of the folks, is, you know, what a lot of people have not been through, what they've been through, don't understand. It takes a lot of courage to come to an event like this. They're absolutely, absolutely determined to make change. But Mark and Jackie, whose son Daniel was a first grader in Sandy Hook Elementary School, or Daniel loves sports, loves outdoor sports, getting muddy. I see my friend Fred Gutenberg, his daughter Jamie was a freshman at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. She was an accomplished dancer. I see Brandon Wolf, who was the shooting at the at the at the Impulse at the Pulse Club not, nightclub. He survived but his two best friends died. Greg Jackson, who was just walking down the street when he was caught in the crossfire of a gunfight. And of course, I see a close friend of Jill's and mine, Congresswoman Gabby Gifford, who is here, who was, uh, who was speaking with her constituents in front of a grocery store in her state when she was shot and a member of her staff was killed. You know, uh, they're here, and their pain is immense. And you know what a lot of you, hopefully many of you, don't know is you've gone through a trauma. No matter how much you work to make sure others don't go through it, every time you show up at an event like this, it brings back when you got that phone call. It brings back the immediacy of what happened at that moment. So I genuinely mean it. Thank you. Thank you for having the courage, the courage to be here, the courage to continue this fight. Senator Blumenthal understands it. A lot of the folks out here understand it. But it takes real courage, so thank you. To turn pain into purpose and demand that we take the action that gives meaning to the word enough. Enough, enough, enough. Because what they want you to know what they want you to do is not just listen. Every day in this country, 316 people are shot every single day. 106 of them die every day. Our flag was still flying at half staff for the victims of the horrific murder of eight primarily Asian American people in Georgia. When 10 more lives were taken in a mass murder in Colorado. You probably didn't hear it, but between those two incidents, less than one week apart, there were more than 850 additional shootings. 850 that took the lives of more than 250 people and left 500, 500 injured. This is an epidemic, for God's sake, and it has to stop. So I'm here to talk about two things. First, the steps we're going to take immediately. And second, the action that needs to be taken going forward to curb the epidemic of gun violence. I asked the Attorney General and his team to identify for me immediate, concrete actions I could take now without having to go through the Congress. And today, I'm announcing several initial steps my administration is taking to curb this epidemic of gun violence. Much more need be done. All right. So a lot to talk about there. <clears throat> I think the first thing that I wanted to point out, and I'd mentioned it a moment ago, right before we went to this clip, is that when we're talking about gun violence, we are talking about a wide range of incidents. And toward the end there, President Biden does, you know, throw out a whole bunch of numbers. He said there were 300 and, uh, 316 people get uh, shot daily. Mm -hmm. And that 106 die. This is, uh, I think, this is an average. And then he yep. said there were 850 shootings 
in between the incident in Atlanta, that was the that was the young man who went out to the uh, the the massage parlor shops, and they were mostly Asian. I think they were all entirely Asian shops. Like they were, they had mostly so. Asian workers, and there might have been a couple. I think there were like two people that were not Asian out of the eight that he shot. <clears throat> And then uh, and then there was the incident in Colorado where 10 people were killed. And he said that there were 850 shootings and there were 250 people killed. So now, so this is changing the nature of the conversation. And I don't know if people realize it because now what we're doing is we, he when he says 850 shootings, there were not 850 shootings with the so-called assault rifles. Mm -hmm. There were 850 shootings, period. But again, he doesn't tell us anything about these shootings. So we don't know, are all of these unjustified? Are all of them justified? Or um, do any of them include police shooting? We don't know. We're not given that information. <clears throat> and, I, and I dug up this graphic that I pulled out. I'm not going to show it on the screen at the moment. But I dug up this graphic and I just kind of put out some information. This is for 2019. So I just want to want people to have a little bit of a sense of, you know, some idea of this uh the difference between say police shootings and civilian shootings and, and, you know, get some idea of the numbers here. So according to, for, for the, uh, for the full year of 2019, Statista reported that there were 697,195 police officers in the U S and then the Washington post, which keeps a record of all the police shootings. You can actually go and they have it starting at 2015 and going, um, going forward. They report 999 fatal police shootings. Okay. Gun Violence Archive reports 14,970 homicide, murder, and accidental deaths, and then 23,760 suicides from guns. So it's a total of 38,730. So there's quite a few there. And then Harvard and Northeastern and Pew report there are at least 72 million individual gun owners. Now, the reason I'm throwing all these numbers out there is this. That means for every 697 officers, there's one shooting. For every 1,859 gun owners, there's one shooting. If we exclude suicides and the reason we might exclude suicides is because that is the same person that's inflicting gun violence is the shooter mm -hmm. so we're not talking about one person shooting another person which i think really is a that, that's a huge difference i think we 60, really need 60 percent almost i believe right so we i think it's really wise to say look Suicide shootings are a bad thing, and we definitely need to handle that. That is a mental health issue that somebody would want to take their life. But when we remove those numbers, then what you get is for every 4,810 gun owners that we know about, these are, the, this, these are only the ones that have reported and said, I'm willing to tell you that I'm a gun owner, mm. that there is one death. So think about that for a moment, folks. 600 uh, for every 697 officers almost every almost 700 for almost every 700 officers there's one fatal shooting for almost 40 uh, for, uh, for uh every 4800 gun owners there is one fatal shooting and this is shooting from one person shooting another okay so i put that out there uh and i made a dopey little graphic and the idea behind it is this it might be we might want to talk about police officer shootings as well. Now, it might be that police officers statistically sh have less unjustified shootings percentage wise. I don't know that it might be the case. But if we're going to talk about gun violence, it is an incomplete conversation to not include police shootings. It is uh, I think it, it is an, it, it, we're doing a disservice by including suicides correct so i just wanted to kind of point that out and you know maybe after i you know maybe in post i'll, I'll throw the, the graphic up there so that people can see it or put some numbers on the screen or something make it a little bit easier since i threw out a whole bunch of numbers there but uh josh what are your thoughts on what biden um, had to say there <clears throat> well just devil's any? advocate yeah oh, oh, do i have any <laughs> <laughs> you know you know 
I don't know if the viewers are lucky or unlucky that we're doing this in the morning because uh, th this is definitely a subject that fires me up a little bit. Right. The um, so far as regarding what he said, I do want to play devil's advocate on one of the statistics you said versus mm -hmm. uh, uh, just because this is what people will do. They'll they'll, they'll nitpick. Um, obviously, you and I, we you go over the numbers. We do think that they need to be delineated down. Just coming up and saying three hundred sixteen people were shot a day, one hundred and six people die. Th those aren't broken down um, into justified, unjustified, or or self inflicted. Um, but you mentioned uh, every 4,800 uh, gun owners, gun owners, there, there's one shooting that's associated per 4,800, and it was yep. one per slightly less than 1,000, 800 and some for, for police officers. The devil's advocate aspect of that would be uh, the amount of uh, chances, uh, the opportunities for, for that to happen. Um, right. Obviously, someone who is enforcing the law who is the monopoly of force is going to have more opportunities for a, a violent interaction than your, than your average citizen. Right. So that can skew those results a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, so I, I just, I just want that to point out and it's, and it's certainly not that I'm um, saying that I just want to be clear that we're not saying that, you know, uh, <clears throat> cops are necessarily uh, bad because they have more shootings. There could be, there's a lot of nuance to all this data. Correct. And, Correct. Uh, and, and I'm just giving this information so that people have a sense yeah. of what they're not getting in this conversation. Yeah. That's really all that it amounts to. I'm not necessarily trying to say this points to something, to some conclusion necessarily. I, I was, you're absolutely correct. I, I was just, uh, and I, I know you weren't doing that. I was just saying that for the viewers um, to want to break our numbers down even further because we're, we're already breaking some. He, he didn't break anything down. He just threw it out there. Um, right. His initial part of this is a lot like uh, Harris, where he's teeing you up emotionally uh, for things. He's talking about the the suffering, the pain and suffering that people have had, the false nightclub, which is all um, all terrible things. I completely agree. Um, however, since he's sharing some stories, um, do you mind if I share a personal story, Dio? Do go right ahead. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> it wasn't me personally. Uh, me individually however uh my best friend that i grew up with um i'm going to change his name um but i am going to just um let's just call his name dave dave and his family uh it was his mom his dad and his sister his sister's uh newborn baby and his grandma were all in columbus ohio uh this was the actual town that they were in they were staying in a hotel and um they were staying in columbus over the night uh because the next morning uh my buddy Dave and his sister, uh, they both uh, do the quarter horse, uh, the barrel racing and, and all those types of things. They're both state championship horse riders. Um, she was uh, she was not uh, participating this weekend, but she came along and had, they had their little baby in the hotel room. So they're in there uh, about ready to uh, call it a night and um, somebody breaks through uh, their hotel room door and, and everybody can say, oh, maybe they were in a bad neighborhood. No, they were in downtown Columbus. And um, breaks through in the door, and guy has a shotgun, and he demands money from everybody. Um, most people don't carry that much cash anymore. I don't know how much he exactly got, but from what they told me, pr probably a couple hundred bucks maybe between all of them. Um, the, the guy was not satisfied with um, what he got, so he went over to uh, the crib and he, he, he placed the barrel of the shotgun on the, the infant's uh, head. So I, I just want to pause right there for a second. We, we just went through this emotion about these victims uh, of uh, supposedly unjustified homicides that Biden was talking about. And, and yes, the ones he specifically mentioned were unjustified, but those victims do count. Well, I want you to think about that little that little baby with the and I'm not and I know I'm doing the exact same thing with the emotion, but hey, we got to reciprocate because everybody matters. You got this perpetrators putting this gun to this baby's head. Nobody knows what to do in the room. Dave's grandmother, who I've known all my life, she was laying down on the floor next to the bed. She had her purse close to her. Thank gosh. She um, pulled out a 357 Magnum and she shot the guy multiple times, uh, almost point blank in the chest. Um, the guy died. He made it out of the hotel room, um, barely, but he, he, he did die. 
Um, now, my buddy Dave, his grandmother has it, it's bothered her that she has taken a life. She's a she's a Christian woman. She goes to church on Sunday. She hates that she had to do it. Um, but according to her, that choice was made by the perpetrator. Uh, you know, you let you put a put a shotgun on a family member, particularly you literally touch the the metal uh, on a child's head. So the thing is, there is a place for guns and I, I, you know, an emotional place for guns. People have a right to defend themselves. Uh, that is a natural right. And for every story that you find in the news about an unjustified shooting, there's probably two or three justified shootings you won't see. Right. In the news, part of the narrative. This story did make the Columbus Dispatch. It was on there. It was a blip. Um, but if nobody in that room was armed, um, the guy could have taken out the entire family. So I just I, I wanted to share that story because it seems like we, we spend a lot of time talking about the lives lost uh, to gun violence, uh, to unjustified gun violence, which we should talk about. But we don't put enough emphasis on what guns can do for people who use them appropriately right. um so uh, you know he he also mentioned uh, for one thing i, I before we i get started on st other stuff he said you know i don't i'm going to try to say this respectfully um I, I was i was dogging on biden a year leading up to the election i was questioning his mental capacity um i i think he was a bad choice by the democrats i think they should have done a lot better um it's really hard to listen to him he really struggles to talk the, the stuttering, the slurring, the confusion. It's terrifying to me that this is a person that has an ink pen who's writing executive orders, just right. to be honest with you. Um, so him saying no amendment is absolute. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's right, and there is a process to change that, a constitutional process. It doesn't mean that you just ignore an amendment, um, which I think they do often. Right. Uh, so... I agree with that. No amendment is absolute. We can change right. amendments. Well, yeah. now let's let's clarify something here because when you when you say that no amendment is absolute, and when he says it, I think we're talking uh, kind of we're talking in two different paradigms here. You are saying that the amendment can be amended, so we you know, and and there is that particular process. So we could say, you know what, turns out. We, somebody got it wrong, you know, this actually, you know, we prohibited something, but maybe it was a good thing, or maybe, you know, we, um, uh, we, maybe society has changed, and we no longer think that the Second Amendment is, is a good idea. So there is a process to go and amend the Constitution and, and, and withdraw that and change it. Well, I mean, the 13th what he's talking about is saying, as written, it is not absolute. And that kind of goes back to uh, oh, the, mm -hmm. the D.C. versus Heller case where Scalia said, hey, you know, uh, no, I think his, his words were no, no amendment was uh, unlimited, I think is what he said, and that you could you, you had limitations on him. And then, you know, he refers to prior court cases and and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. You know, so legally speaking, there is some precedent in saying that the amendment as written is uh, uh, does come with underlying limitations. You and I would disagree with that notion. So when I look at the Second Amendment, I say, as written, it says, Congress shall make no law, no law, period. And this is where libertarians kind of get laughed at by peoples because we say, hey, yes, I can own a tank. It's okay. Yeah. Because it doesn't say that, uh, that the government has the authority to limit me on on the, the choice of weapons so anyway i'm sorry i just want to interject that because no, i want people no, to be very I, clear I, you know, I, I'm, we're talking I'm glad two different I'm, things i'm really glad you did because that that ties back into what i said initially with uh uh regarding the my default statement about the constitution where the rights actually come from mm -hmm. and that i i am a, a textualist i do believe it's i mean this the constitution is written in the king's english um you can read it it's very clear it's very concise um you know, I, I take issue with the fact that we have to hire legal scholars to interpret these things for us. But um, right. the, the fact that we have an, a, the, a process, an amendment process built into the Constitution is the primary evidence that it is textual. Um, it is absolute. If you mm -hmm. want to change it, there is a process. 
reimagining and reinterpreting through jurisprudence is 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 a disaster. It has been a disaster right. since 1803, Marbury Madison. Yes, they got they got it wrong. And you know what? I find it very disingenuous and maybe backhanded, especially coming from someone who wrote the crime bill, to mention um, that the con- not everybody can own guns. And I, and I want to talk about that for a minute, because one of the things that people who couldn't own guns were minorities. Um, even after uh, uh, the, the Civil War, even after the 13th Amendment, um, laws and states were switched around. You know, they kept playing with it. They were like a it was a pushing the black, what they called the black codes, I believe. They pushed further past the, uh, the 13th Amendment, and they prohibited uh, a lot of blacks from owning firearms. Um, and that was to keep them oppressed. It didn't, they didn't have any tools to defend themselves. Right. And uh, so the gun control truly was a, a, racist, uh, a racist thing. And uh, for him to use, uh, well, not everybody could own guns as if that was a defense to disarm more people. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I just I wish people would look into that a little bit more as to what disarmament right. actually is. Right. And, and that's another going back to my previous criticism, not of you, but just in general. This is, again, where Biden is not being very clear what he means. So. When I look at it, when you look at it, we hear we hear him say, hey, there were limits from the beginning and not everybody could own firearms. I am not aware of any law that said certain people can't own firearms in the context which he is trying to reference, because I, mm-hmm. I, I really doubt that what he meant was, yeah, you know, black people weren't uh, weren't uh, permitted to own firearms um, mm-hmm. at one point. And so therefore, see, that's that's part of our argument. I don't think that's what he's meaning. I think what he thinks he's saying is, hey, there were certain people, maybe a felon, maybe somebody who who had done this particular bad deed that was restricted from owning firearms. And I think what he's also saying is there were certain firearms that were not permitted to be had. And it's funny because back on the campaign trail, uh, he got he got hammered because he said that in the Revolutionary War, a citizen could not own a cannon. And even PolitiFact, you know, the right wing bastion there that always supports Second Amendment, said, no, that's actually not true. And in that article, they had talked to a historian who said, at a federal level, there aren't any, there weren't any laws that were prohibiting people from having firearms, but you might find some here and there in local in, in various locales and various cities. And I know there was one that was pointed out, I think it was in Boston actually, where they had a limitation on how you could store gunpowder. But the purpose of it was so that it wouldn't burn the building down, yeah. right? So that it wouldn't catch fire and cause a catastrophe. So they said, look, we need to store these things separately. So you can't store these with these, right? And I don't remember, I don't remember the specific details, but I know there was this, uh, some limitation, but the limitation was very practical in the sense of it's, it's like saying, hey, um, we don't want you to store fireworks next to, you know, uh, something that is, uh, you know, that, that's causing sparks and flames because it's a yeah. bad idea, right? So we're going to limit that. Uh, but, but people could certainly own cannons. And in fact, there were mm. privateers who owned warships. Yeah. They literally owned a whole warship. So, and, and there, and there was talk about people that owned, um, oh, what is those, what are those guns called? The, um, I'm drawing a blank on it now. It's, uh, it's the one that has the belled end at the end of it. Um, uh, you talking about, the, you're talking about a musket? No, it's not a musket. It was a, it was like a bigger one. It's the one you think of like when somebody shoots an elephant or something. I don't know if that's exactly what oh. they used them for, but okay. it's, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a shotgun. And I believe it was belled at the very end. And yeah. I think the purpose kind of was similar to like a shotgun blast. And I'm trying okay. to remember the, t- the name of it. And I'm, I'm just drawing a blank at this, at this moment. Um, I'll probably think of it after the show. Yeah, yeah, that's um, what'll happen. <laughs> but, but there were, but there were guns. Uh, yeah. There was the the, uh, is it the puckling? Puckling gun. Yeah, I think it's the puckling gun, which was um, which was an uh, 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 an automatic firing uh, crew serve weapon. Mm-hmm. And at that time, one of the demonstrations that they had was having it shoot in the rain, something that other guns couldn't do. 
-hmm. So the idea that citizens couldn't have some serious weapons at the time is garbage. Yeah. Except for when it comes to certain communities. That is yeah, true. That, that's that's why I wanted to mention that because like the the only like big umbrella thing that I could that, that I could find throughout history was that you know the disenfranchised communities like that that they right. did. So far as uh federal gun control checking people, gun house, you know, that 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 that's just ridiculous. People had cannons on their front porch. I mean, not everybody, of course, and I know you and I right. have talked past about you know there were some towns on a local level like that they wouldn't want you to bring your artillery and your stuff into town which is you know reasonable um, right you know um but you know what he implies I, the more i thought about after watching that you know the day i kept thinking it's like it seems like he's uh he's trying to draw more emotion into it as like see people have always been oppressed with guns no the the, the state oppressed people with their rights is what right. happened and you know so yeah. yeah. Well, it just, might be what it might be. Um, I don't have the specific. I think it was 1934 is in the United States when we had our first federal firearms act. And that yeah. was a result of the Valentine's Day massacre, which was gang on gang violence at that time. There was some yeah. issues. Um, I, I can't remember what the issue was, but there was some gangs, uh, some gang members like mo like mob. You know, this is like Al Capone type mob. And they dressed up as police officers and they went and rounded up some other guys and put them up against a wall and then just shot them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think they had Tommy guns at the time. Yeah. And that caused it was called the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It was a huge thing. Uh, I believe that occurred in 1929. And so then five years later, 1934, they instituted the first federal. So this is the first federal act was 1934. And the. Uh, you know, like 143 years, I believe, after the Second Amendment. So for 143 years, there was no such thing as a national limitation on firearms in this country. Mm -hmm. so oh yeah, by, why, by the way, for when he talks around. about phony arguments, he might he might want to talk about his own phony arguments. Yeah, no, he's full of phony arguments. And, you know, and by the way, I, I I didn't mention this this time, but I always like to refer. I don't like the 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 wordage that a lot of politicians use phony argument your your automatic it's it's a dismissive belittling position that doesn't right. lead to conversation and obviously uh that's not what they're trying to do but, right um, well it's the cart before the horse yeah you know it's, yeah, it's if 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 so here's something that people will probably very much recognize in terms of cart before the horse and that same argument a lot of times you'll talk to somebody and you'll have this idea and you say, well, I think we should do this. And somebody says, ah, that's a simplistic view of things. Yeah. Well, what they've done is they've they've told you the assertion, but they haven't given you any facts to support it. And so it's kind of caught before that. What you need to do is you need to say, OK, here's where's the problem with this particular argument. Here's where you've made a mistake. Here's this. Here's this. And you you, you lay it out and you break down somebody's argument. And then after you can say see why it's simple uh it's it's over it, you've you've oversimplified it you can't just say it's oversimplified because you haven't actually made any assertion you haven't given anybody any evidence at all you've just said no you, you it's, it's like you said it's very very dismissive and to say there's phony arguments right up front he didn't even tell anybody what he was going to do so he led with saying oh yeah, yeah. phony arguments we totally uh are legit in what we're about to tell you it's you know it's a great idea. It's it's, it's how do we even know? It's political rhetoric. It's it's right. teeing it up. He, you know, Kamala set up the emotion. Here comes Biden setting up the uh, dismissing any kind of intellectual argument. And right. by the way, he's already starting with the presumption that that act in 1934, the National Firearms Act, is constitutional. He's already right. he's assuming that as he goes forward. When I'm sitting here telling you it's not constitutional, it should right. exist. And we didn't and, have one for 143 yeah, years. And, of this country, and everything so. that's built off of that, including the ATF and everything that we have now, shouldn't exist the way that it does. Right. And uh, so I already have to start with a false presumption with ever, whatever his executive orders are that it's built upon a foundation that's constitutional to begin with. And it's not. So. Right. And, so. and we're not we're not breaking this down a la philosophical logic, you know, in, in, in the you know, deep sense, like. OK, he made this super duper logical error and therefore, the you know, we're not doing this is just a simple. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you're going to tell me an argument is phony, tell me which ones. 
start with those, break it down, tell me what's wrong with the argument, and then maybe call it a phony argument. But honestly, if you break down an argument and you tell me why an argument is no good and you do a good job, you don't have to tell me it's phony. You don't no. have to tell me anything because you told me everything that I needed to know why the argument is no good. So right. it's it's nothing more than a personal attack. It, it, it's it's yeah. really not much more. It, you, you might as well just say people making these arguments are terrible people because yeah. it's about the same. He, he's he's giving us about the same amount. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of what they're doing. It. It's kind of yeah. what they're doing because with Kamala holding hands with the victims and stuff, you're implying that people who are pro-gun or whatever uh, are not – uh, caring, compassionate people. Right. That's, that, that's just ridiculous. Right. All right. Do we want to move on to this first uh, action item? All right. So let's go ahead and get that teed up here. So we will go ahead and let's see what we've got here. First, want to rein in the proliferation of so-called ghost guns. These are guns that are homemade, built from a kit and include directions on how to finish the firearm. You can go buy the kit. They have no serial numbers. So when they show up at a crime scene, they can't be traced. And the buyers aren't required to pass a background check to buy the kit to make the gun. Consequently, anyone, anyone from a criminal to a terrorist can buy this kit in as little as 30 minutes put together a weapon. You know, I want to see these kits treated as firearms under the Gun Control Act, which is going to require that the seller and manufacturers make the key parts with serial numbers and run background checks on the buyers when they walk in to buy that package. Okay, so let's talk about that, Josh. Man, that's, uh, you know, I think the first thing that really stuck out to me is he said, hey, there's no serial numbers. He's making his big issue about serial numbers. And, you know, I... I, I've not conducted a, um, uh, uh, you know, I've not participated in any <clears throat> uh, investigation, of course, because I'm not law enforcement. And so I would imagine that it does kind of give you a little bit of evidence to, to work with, like, you know, trying to, tr you know, having a serial number. But um, generally, it seems to me that what happens is when the police get called to a scene, they, uh, they have some bodies. And they probably don't have a firearm yet. So they are mm. first looking for a suspect. And somebody tells them, like, hey, the suspect was, you know, five foot six, uh, appeared to be a white male. He was wearing a brown coat. He, you know, whatever. He, he had, you know, some white tennis shoes on and some jeans. And, you know, he was wearing glasses, so on and so forth. And he was carrying, you know, what looked to be, uh, you know, an M16. I don't know. Whatever, whatever people that happened to have survived are able to describe, right? And so right now they have evidence of who they're looking for. Um, and so I'm not really sure where the serial number plays a role in this because once you get a firearm, the serial number, to my knowledge, doesn't help you identify if that's the gun that shot somebody. What does identify it is the casing and the um uh man doing this in the morning is tough my brain just isn't working but the um uh the the, the residue matching the residue uh, and all that information which again to my knowledge doesn't require a serial number so i'm i'm so it seems unclear exactly why not having a serial number is such a big deal and i think it's because he's basing it on this presumption that doesn't exist which is Hey, we've got all these ghost guns and terrorists could have, you know, everybody gets scared when, you know, you hear the word terrorist, but that's not actually happening. People aren't being shot with ghost guns. Mm -hmm. And we already went over some of the data earlier on, you know, like you, you've got so many people that are committing suicide. You do have so many people that are actually committing homicide. And then you have some defensive use of firearms. And if that's the violence that we want to curb, then that is the violence that we need to address. So he's already starting off in his very first point, addressing something that is unrelated to the problem that he's trying to solve. He's trying to solve a problem that does not yet exist. Mm. What do you got? You're, I mean, spot on. Because so we're going to assume if you're going to take executive orders, you're going to be addressing something specific. 
And one will assume, especially the way they started out, that all of these, these measures are going to be somehow to protect the average American citizen. I think that's a reasonable assumption that that's what they're trying to do. Right. The point number one, like you said, the ghost guns, where's this epidemic of ghost guns, people getting hurt? Um, beyond that, I mean, I, which I, I don't want to go on a tangent on that. It, it doesn't matter uh, if there was a problem with it. But I was asked a long time ago, a few, well, a few years ago, somebody said to me, it's like, okay, you look at a law, uh, you look at any kind of regulation, uh, who is, uh, who's it punishing the most and who does it benefit the most? Right. Well, as you said, this right off the bat, he mentioned serial numbers. That helps the government track, regulate, tax. Um, it, it, yes, evidence at the end. There's ballistic evidence. You know, you could measure things on the casing, uh, on the uh, the projectile itself. You can match it to the, the, the gun, the specific gun that it came from. I, I, I get all of that. Um, that it could potentially be used down the road for enforcement purposes at the very end of maybe an investigation. Right. But there's not a problem here. There's not a mass problem. We don't have an epidemic of, of, of gun issues. Uh, I think you mentioned to me the other day that uh, wondering how much maybe different gun manufacturers may have had a, a role with this executive order. Um, you know, what, what kind of uh, economic aspect, you know, impact would this have uh, in the gun manufacturing world, I don't know. And I'm sure somebody could benefit from ghost guns being uh, regulated more. Um, right. But he's, he's bringing up an issue that doesn't really exist and is expanding government into, uh, into private sales and uh, uh, what you do with your 3D printer. Uh, 3D printers will probably be regulated and capped more. So. Right. And, and, and I think what people need to realize is when I mention this idea of who's benefiting economically, I don't know that any of the gun manufacturers had a necessarily a role in this, but I do think that they may benefit from this because yeah. right now it is the gun manufacturers who are, who are responsible for putting serial numbers on firearms. And I would imagine that they have some identified process for determining what goes into a serial number. I've worked in other industries where we have these kind of similar numbers and they have a specific criteria on how they're developed or how they're, how they're generated. And they help trace back to the manufacturer date and all this other stuff. And, and, and there's actually some value there. Uh, but right now, regular citizens, you and I aren't creating serial numbers and sure, maybe I put a, maybe I, 3D print out some parts and I put a serial number on there, but because it's not traced and tracked and, you know, following some set of sort of standard from the government, it really doesn't mean anything. So all it sounds like is that this is a great way to limit people, hobbyists, enthusiasts from printing their own parts. And again, when he says ghost guns, it's kind of a misleading term because it's really, it would be really, it'd be better to call it ghost parts because you're not actually 3D printing yeah. the entire gun. You're 3D printing a portion of the gun, and then you're matching it up to actually manufactured other parts, and you're assembling this entire this entire gun together. Mm -hmm. And so, so you you just um, it, it just limits what I can do as a person. And if I want a 3D printed part, by having this uh, requirement that they have a serial number, that means anything that I 3D print would be illegal. And if I wanted to do it legally, I would have to go and get it from a manufacturer. So now it gives a little bit of advantage to the manufacturer who's already set up and already got the system in place to put out serial numbers. So I think, I, I think it does this, this first one does two things. It has nothing to do with at all with what he said we need to address. No. And it gives an advantage to the gun manufacturers, even if they haven't asked for it. But more importantly, it gives advantage to the government who said, we need to have traceability and there's a system that they've got their hand in. So this allows them to put their hand into this new technology that we've got. And not to mention at the end of the day too, whoever, uh, whoever these executive orders or any kind of gun control legislation impacts, somewhere you're going to have an innocent, nonviolent person become a criminal. Which right. means you are advocating for the state to be violent, to put someone in a cage, find them, whatever, uh, for 
not hurting anyone else. Right. I just want to put that because if this is really all about people, we also everything has consequences, cause and effect. Causality right. is permanent feature of the future. So right. you create an executive order and you're saying ghost guns, ghost parts more accurately would be um, you know, criminal to do to engage in. You are making innocent people, people who are nonviolent, who are not hurting anybody, you're making them criminals. I you are. And you're contributing in some ways, you can say that you're shifting the gun violence or adding to it, depending on how you want to look at it. So if you assume that this first action item will contribute to a reduction in gun violence, again, we're only talking about a reduction potentially in the civilian world from civilian on civilian act, um, activity. Mm -hmm. But in order to enforce it means that the police or the ATF or some other government agency will be required to go and forcibly take somebody's weapons from them, potentially putting them at risk, um, or they may, um, uh, they, you know, they, they could engage in certain kind of raids and, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess is the same thing, basically forcibly. So what you end up doing is you, you are either shifting the violence. So we get the reduction in one area potentially, and yeah. then we increase it in another area, or you don't reduce it at all, but you still increase it even if marginally in another area. So it's not mm -hmm. really helping the situation because no. you're just creating more criminals to have to go after and hope that they will behave in such a way that an officer doesn't feel that is necessary to shoot them. Yeah. So I, I think this is, I think, I think we're already starting off on a bad foot here, but let's see, who knows, maybe the second one, maybe we'll get on board with that. Let's just check it out. Let's see what we got. The second action we're going to take, back in 2000, the year 2000, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms released a report on its investigations of firearms trafficking in America. The report was of pivotal value, it was an important tool for policymakers when I was in the Senate and beyond, at all levels, to stop firearms from being illegally diverted into dangerous hands. Today, with online sales and ghost guns, times and trafficking methods have changed, and we have to adjust. We also have to ask the Justice Department to release a new annual report. This report will better help policymakers address firearms trafficking as it is today, not what it was yesterday. Okay, so first thing I hear is he talks about we want to curb this illegal diversion of firearms <clears throat> from people who may own them legally um, or, have, or have acquired them illegally to somebody who's going to use them in, uh, in a way that is increasing our gun violence. So it's very interesting because he says, hey, we need to know about what's going on today. This is a problem. If you don't know how it's going on, you know, if you don't know the extent of the problem, you can't say there is a problem. So it's kind of a he's kind of it's kind of a catch 22 in a sense, because he's basically saying there's a problem, but we just don't know about it. So we need to study so we can identify the depth of the problem here. Yeah. But here's the issue again, similar to that first one. When I listen to news stories, most of the time, the person. So when it comes to uh, when it when it comes to the mass shootings, I believe in most, if not all cases, the person acquired them legally. So yeah. the problem was not some illegal transfer of a firearm. They acquired them legally. So this is, I, I believe this is like almost all, if not all of the mass shootings. It's a little different when it comes to crime on the streets and a shooting here and there. There are, there are illegal weapon transfers, right? And, and so you do have this. I mean, there are people that sell them out of the back of the trunk. There are also people who sell them to other countries under a program called Fast and Furious. Is that being included, President Biden? Which um, happened when he was the vice president. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so he I, contributed to the illegal uh, firearm trans, uh, transactions to people in another country, but yet he has the audacity to say, well, we need to fix the one here that. That, that we don't even know how big of a problem it really is. 
No, so you're I absolutely think, right. And, I think it's and very I disingenuous. That, I, it is very disingenuous. And I love the fact that you mentioned uh, uh, Fast and Furious. Um, you know, er Eric Holder should be in jail. Um, you know, th the United States of America is the, um, the largest uh, gun weapon, if you will, not even just gun, but weapons dealer in the world. Uh, you know, if there's violence going on at some corner of the globe, uh, terrorist or whatever, you could probably check the weapons themselves. They probably have a familiar U.S. based manufacturer name on it, and they probably got there by our military transport. Um, so I, I do find it very disingenuous. It's, it, you know, they're, they're, we want a new report from the ATF um, every year. We want it updated so we know what's going on today, which is uh, creating. I, they didn't talk about how much this would cost, what the reports. I, oh, about. yeah. By the way, I want to point out we're now past uh, bullet point number two, and he has not addressed how either one of these things would impact those statistics he gave us at the beginning. The 316 Correct. shot daily, 106 die, and I'm going to keep mentioning that because point one and point two doesn't say or do anything to address the numbers that they supposedly are addressing. It's just more control up at this point. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and dig into number three. <clears throat> and again, folks, we are waiting for that one opportunity for both of us to say, man, you know, that's actually a great idea. We should we should totally support that one. And it might happen. But again, I doubt it. The third change, we want to treat pistols modified with stabilizing braces with the seriousness they deserve. A stabilizing brace hook and a pencil essentially makes that pistol a hell of a lot more accurate and a mini rifle. As a result, it's more lethal, effectively turning into a short-barreled rifle. That's what the alleged shooter in Boulder appears to have done. I want to be clear that these modifications to firearms that make them more lethal should be subject to the National Firearms Act. The National Firearms Act requires that a potential owner pay $200 fee and submit their name and other identifying information to the Justice Department. Just say they would if they went out and purchased a silencer for a gun. Okay, so um, <laughs> that's very interesting. He wants to. He keeps talking about them. It makes them more lethal. <clears throat> that's actually not even true, because lethal is what can kill you. It yeah. makes them more accurate, yes. and it makes actually the shooter more accurate. The gun cannot be any more or less lethal. Because once the bullet comes out, if it hits the target, it depending on how it hits, it will be lethal. Yes. Stabilizing brace or not, you end up shooting somebody in the face with a firearm. Uh, it's lethal, more than likely. Like it, you didn't change the lethality of it, and I think so. I think it's a rather absurd argument that he's making. Oh, um, it, it, yeah. Go ahead. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely <clears throat> right. You know accurately lethality versus accuracy I, I understand if you can be like if he's trying to play on words if you can be more accurate theoretically you can be more lethal i get that however anybody that own guns anybody that has guns been around guns um they always tell you to identify your target and you want to be able to be as accurate as possible um you want to make sure that you don't have any stray bullets going anywhere mm -hmm. um you know, to me, it seems illogical to want to make any firearm less controllable. You, you know, the, the objective of any anybody who owns a firearm, nobody's saying, well, how can I make this weapon less accurate? Right. <laughs> I mean, you want to, even especially responsible gun owners, we want to know what our target is downrange. Right. We want to know where we are. We are. Uh, shooting we know want to know what's behind what we're shooting there's so many different right. aspects <clears throat> we want the, the weapon to be as accurate as possible right now, granted yes could that be in the hands of somebody who is having bad intentions and they're accurate of right. course it could end up like that right. but let's think of all the um the people that are shot with stray bullets um you know it, it's just i i think it's 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 not disingenuous for one thing and, and it's it's really a bad argument uh, to put on a st to to block stabilizing braces for what they're trying to do, and once again, I'll circle all the way back around. What 
part of our numbers is this going to fix? Right. The, you know, who, what is this actually helping? You know, it's just, it's just simply, it's not. You right. Know, it's and just, he, he points out the, the, the Boulder, Colorado shooter. Um, but the problem is this doesn't seem to be part of the epidemic that he's talking about. Like, he's not like, Hey, there's an epidemic of people that have stabilizing braces and they're out there just shooting people left and right. But like you said, what this does is it take and, and like we both agree, this takes away from the accuracy and it violates two of the four gun safety laws or uh, rules, I guess, not really laws, yeah. but two of the uh, four gun safety rules. So if you're watching and you're not familiar with them, let me just read them to you really quickly. It'll make sense. And these, if you're a gun enthusiast, you already know these. Most people can, you know, can tell you them like that. Right. I know friends that are just really avid about these. OK, first one, all guns are always loaded, period. You treat a firearm as if it's always loaded. This means you don't do stupid stuff like point it at somebody, which leads to the second rule. Never let the muzzle cover or point at anything you are not prepared to destroy. OK, so this is the first rule that he would be trying to violate with this stabilizing by, by making these stabilizing braces harder to get, because what he's basically saying is, hey, <laughs> I don't want you to be able to be as accurate in shooting a target because he's assuming that the only people that might want to shoot a target, shoot a person would be people that have, have, have ill intent that are shooting with unjustified force as opposed to maybe somebody that, um, uh, you know, for whatever reason is in a situation where they need to uh, defend themselves or somebody else. Rule number three, keep your finger off of the trigger until your sights are on the target. Okay. So you do not walk around. You might see pictures of somebody, you know, they've got their finger. It's funny. Every time I get on Facebook and I've seen like pictures, they were floating around during the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, but you would see like pictures where somebody would put like a black person um, with some firearms or maybe like a, you know, two, you know, a black couple or even a black family. I saw one where it was a whole black family and they were standing there and they had firearms. And then you saw a white family uh, with firearms or, you know, a white couple or whatever. And the caption was, if you have a problem with one and not the other, uh, then the problem is with you and something like that. Right. And it was funny because every time I saw one of those pictures, my libertarian friends would ju jump in and the first thing that they would talk about was trigger finger discipline. Trigger and, finger. Like, and, and if it didn't matter white or black, if that finger was, was on the trigger, that was the first thing they noticed every time didn't matter. But if it was off that trigger, Hey, I'm okay with this. They got the finger off the trigger. I'm cool. I'm happy. Like that's it. That's what. I'm... So fourth one. This is this, this is the rule that uh, that is also being violated. That that also uh, we would be violating is be sure of your target. The whole point of a stabilizing brace is to be sure of the target that I'm shooting. Because like you said, we do not want to shoot innocent bystanders. If somebody is a threat and they need to be put down, we want to make sure to only hit that threat. We want to make sure not to uh, shoot at other people accidentally um so i i think this is uh i think this is a very bad uh this this is a very bad um third option you know we're, we're we're still not on board because it's not addressing like you said the um the other uh the statistics that he talked about it's putting people in a position where they can't really follow the four gun safety rules in the first place and then um the other thing that i think we should point out is it's a 200 dollar fee in order to do this so people that don't have as much means, uh, you know, people that are lower income, this is for you. This, yeah. this, this bill impacts you because somebody who's wealthy, somebody who's making, you know, 150, 200 grand a year, it's probably not going to be a big deal to them. You know, um, that, I mean, it will be a big deal. Don't get me wrong. I mean, nobody likes to spend $200 when they shouldn't yeah. have to, but they will be able to afford it. Whereas people who are low, so, you know, in a lower socioeconomic status may not be able to afford it. And that's unfair. That is, that is treating people separately. And again, like you said, still not solving the problem that we've, we're talking about addressing. Yeah. Fines or permits are just levies against the poor is all they are. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, another way to say it, you may have heard it's a tax against the poor. That's all this is. This is a tax against people that can't afford it. Fourthly, 
During my campaign for president, I wanted to make it easier for states to adopt extreme risk protection order laws. They're also called red flag laws, which everybody in this lawn knows, but many people listening do not know. These laws allow a police or family member to petition a court in their jurisdiction and say, I want you to temporarily remove from the following people any firearm they may possess because they're a danger and a crisis. They're presenting a danger to themselves and to others. And the court makes a ruling. To put this in perspective, more than half of all suicides, for example, involve the use of a firearm. But when a gun's not available, an attempt at suicide, the death rate drops precipitously. States that have red flag laws have seen and seen the reduction in the number of suicides in their states. Every single month, by the way, an average of 53 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner. I wrote the Violence Against Women Act. It's been a constant struggle to keep it moving. We know red flag laws can have significant effect in protecting women from domestic violence. And we know red flag laws can stop mass shooters before they can act out their violent plans. I'm proud, excuse the point of personal privilege we used to say in the Senate, I'm proud that the red flag law in my home state of Delaware was named after my son, Attorney General Bo Biden, our son, excuse me, Joe, who proposed that legislation back in 2013. I want to see a national red flag law and legislation to incentivize states to enact their own red flag laws. Today, I asked the Justice Department to publish a model red flag legislation so states can start crafting their own laws right now. Just like with background checks, the vast majority of the Americans support these ex extreme risk protection order laws. And it's time to put these laws on the books and protect even more people. The Attorney General will have more to say about this in a moment. Additionally, we recognize that cities across the country are experiencing historic spikes in homicides, as the law enforcement can tell you. The violence is hitting black and brown communities the hardest. Homicide is the leading cause of death of black boys and men ages 15 to 34. The leading cause of death. But there are proven strategies that reduce gun violence in urban communities. And there are programs that have demonstrated they can reduce homicides by up to 60 percent in urban communities. But many of these have been badly underfunded or not funded at all of late. Gun violence in America, for those of you who think of this from an economic standpoint listening to me, estimated to cost the nation $280 billion, let me say it again, $280 billion a year. You say, how could that be, Joe? Hospital bills, physical therapy, trauma counseling, legal fees, prison costs, and the loss of productivity. Not to mention the psychological damage done to the children who live in these cities watching this happen, knowing someone it happened to. This gun violence in our neighborhood is having profound impact on our children, even if they're never involved in pulling the trigger or being the victim of on the other side of the trigger. For a fraction of the cost of gun violence, we can save lives, create safe and healthy communities, and build economies that work for all of us, and save billions of American dollars. In the meantime, much of it as Senator Cicilline knows, is taxpayer money. Whoo! Goodness. First thoughts, Josh. <laughs> First thoughts? <laughs> it's the best you ones. Know, I, I, I get all kinds of names that start popping in my head. Breonna Taylor, Duncan Limp, and stuff. People who have been killed with uh, risk protection orders. Look, he, once again, he brings in a lot of emotion to... Um, uh, to take place of his argument, um, implying that, you know, if, if you are against risk protection orders, you don't want to protect women or 
something of that nature. Um, and I really am bothered by, he seemed to be more concerned at the end about the economic aspect of it. Um, you know, what was it? $280 billion a year. Yep. He mentioned, yep. um, you know, I, <clears throat> okay. Let, let's just, let's just talk. Let, let's just assume for a second that these risk protection orders are a good thing, which I, they're not since 2015, almost 80% of our mass shooters, they had been checked out by some federal agency, usually the FBI. Uh, even the Pulse nightclub gentleman, uh, Omar, I, I think I told you before, uh, he had worked um, down in Port St. Lucie. He had been checked out uh, by the FBI. So the, these events still happen. So obviously they're not foolproof, right? Right. Um, you know, <clears throat> He had mentioned a lot of false things about suicides. Now, they did dip down in 2018 a little bit, but suicides are still pretty high. There's not really been any evidence that risk protection orders have prevented suicides in the way that you would think. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, most suicides uh, tend to come out of the blue, it seems. Um, you know, someone might be At least for others. Do what? At least for others at least for well no that's what i'm saying for others and that, that's yeah. the thing like and that's from others is where risk protection orders come in like a right a friend or a spouse um they really don't unfortunately they don't prevent suicides um the way that um they're trying to project with uh these eos right if i have a friend and they might be suicidal they're probably not telling people they might be but in general they're keeping it to themselves yeah. and when they commit suicide, all of a sudden what happens is people start going, oh, you know, now that this tragedy has happened, I realized the red flags that were there that I didn't recognize beforehand, right? And I it's, think that's the point that people are missing uh, and that he's, that he's kind of ignoring yeah. when it comes to suicide is that they're not walking around saying, you know, I'm probably going to commit suicide within the next two weeks. I just want to let you know that. And yeah. it'll probably be with a gun. And it's not that obvious. And it's, it, it, I, don't, I don't think that I've heard too many stories where it was relatively obvious at all until people go back and look and say, oh, man, I yeah. wish I had realized what that meant. But, 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 then, but then you're looking for it. You know, right. it, you're, you're looking for signs. Whenever you're close with someone, they're not always there. Right. And, um, you know, and his implying that um, if someone, do, you know, someone doesn't decide to kill themselves, whether they have a gun or not, the decision has been made. And it, it, we don't need to break down suicide here, but mm -hmm. if someone doesn't have a gun, that's not going to save their life. OK, right. They're, they're going to find other things. And I don't like the the emphasis blaming suicide on guns. Uh, that is a mental health Gun is a tool. It's an instrument, just like anything right. else. It doesn't think. It doesn't feel. Um, this takes away uh, the what I think we should look at. You know, not necessarily through the government, but we should give more of a cultural nod to is mental health. We need to yeah. pay attention to that. And and blaming suicide. Oh, you know what? Someone's safe if they don't have a gun. No, no. You still haven't helped the person. Right? Yeah, exa exactly. You still have a human being that you're not helping there. Uh, but anyhow, back to risk protection orders. You know, I. In some states, it could be a disgruntled ex-spouse. It could be uh, whatever, you know, or say if it is a spouse, you, you know, removing someone's due process uh, is a problem, even temporary. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it costs a lot of, say you get your, your firearm seized through a, a red flag order. Good luck getting them back. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a time uh, intensive process. It's pricey. Um, and not to mention too, you're, you're, you've been uh, removed and stripped of one of your rights to defend yourself, right? Uh, you know, based upon uh, basically hearsay. Not that it yeah. always is, um, <clears throat> you know. And also too, like he, he mentioned, we have a, a rash of homicides. Now I'm going to say something that's really unpopular. Um, <clears throat> whether if we're talking about someone who is home in an abusive relationship, whether it's male, female, whatever. Uh, or whether if you're having um, difficulties in, in your communities, there's been too many uh, murders and, and, and things. We have to be accountable for ourselves. 
Okay. So with, with self ownership comes self accountability. If you're in an, a, an environment uh, that is not, um, let's just say, um, presenting a good quality of life, uh, at some point you have to take accountability and leave. It's, it's not, it is not society or the government's responsibility to uh, hold your hand through everything. And he mentioned that we have homicides, like we got some communities, there's tons of homicides. We have cultural problems. It's not a, it's not a gun problem. We have a cultural problem. Right. If someone is shooting up people in your neighborhood and you know who they are and the government or the state comes in and says, you know, who's pulling the trigger. If you don't tell them, if you don't come out and say, okay, you know, this is who we need to go after. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. There's no, there's no level of accountability. So that's a cultural problem. And I don't want, just because there's a cultural problem here and there doesn't mean that you punish everybody. Right. So, so if there's crimes going on, if people are actually engaging in things, you need to speak up, you need to do something and you need to be accountable for yourself. Right. You know, I think there's another angle to look at that as well. So let me start by pointing out, uh, talking about his homicide. And I'm kind of, I'm going to weave my way back to this issue of you, you know, protecting the vulnerable. So he talked about homicide and he said, hey, there's been like a 60% drop. I'm really dubious of that because you have places that have strong gun laws like Chicago, and they still have high rates of violence. But he specifically talks about young black men. And he says, hey, you know what? Young black men between the ages, I think he said 15 and 34, have a high degree of homicide. First of all, homicide includes many things. It may or may not include a gun. It could include a stabbing. It could include somebody running you over. It could include a beatdown. Now, there's probably some truth that maybe a lot of the homicides are gun related. I'll, I'll, I will go ahead and accept that on face value. But he talks about this $280 billion and he's kind of connecting them together. He's like, you know, we've got this $280 billion related to gun violence. And again, he's talking about now he's kind of gotten away from this idea of we need to address mass shooters. He's just talking about gun violence in general. So it could just be somebody that goes and shoots their one single neighbor, just one person, right? So this is now included. And he's saying that we've got this $280 billion cost. First and foremost, it might be wise to point out that it's not really the government's job to try to save people money. So that's not their job. And it, as far as I know, they have never been good at that. Never once have I heard, you know, a strong argument that comes out or any argument for that matter, where they said, hey, you know what? There was this cost. And now after we implemented this, <laughs> Americans are saving so much money. Geico does it. The government, not so much. No. So my question is, how much of that $280 billion cost, how much of those, all those homicides that young black men are succumbing to are related to the war on drugs? Yeah, exactly. Because prohibition increased violence in the population. And when prohibition was, uh, when, when we got rid of prohibition, violence went down. Same thing with the drug war. The government has put into place and said, look, people can't have drugs. And so th what happens is it drives everything underground and there is a cost when it goes underground because, uh, you know, there, there aren't the checks and balances, if you will, that you would have in a standard society. And, and what I mean by that is it's since it's not out in the open, it becomes more dangerous because people have to try to conceal it and they have <clears throat> to fight in ways that um, that they don't have to fight on the open market. So if I want it, so if drugs were legal and you had a company and I had a company, rather than shooting it out at each other, we would have to maybe compete uh, in, in the open market through ways like uh, better commercials, better products, better mm -hmm. advertising. I might have to hire a really great designer to design some, some new material that's gonna be appealing so that people will wanna buy my drugs and not buy your drugs, which is exactly what happens now. We see this, you, you turn on the television and they're like, such and such drugs and you know they've got this family that's walking around you know uh in, in like a nice sunny scene out in an open field and they're talking about how the man you know was having a problem you know whatever maybe he was having some breathing problem but now he's taking this this drug and now he can enjoy going outside and uh spending time with his children stuff like that right this is the cost that's paid when you're on the open when you're on the open market 
because they can be open about it. Mm -hmm. When it's underground, it's a different story because they don't run advertisements. Yeah. So the way to compete tends to be with conflict, sometimes mm -hmm. violent conflict. And so how much is the drug war contributing to that $280 billion? How much is the drug war contributing to all the homicides, whatever they may be, whether it's a stabbing or a shooting? And so I look at it and I say, hey, if you want to do something, take away the uh, decriminalized drugs, bring it out on the open market, and then let's talk about dealing with whatever addictions that are there the same way that we deal with alcohol. Because I think that um, effectively what's going to happen with the red flag laws is that they're, they're really not going to contribute to a reduction in homicide because, <laughs> let's be honest here, uh, I ran with some unsavory crowds when I was younger. Let's just put it this way. There aren't too many people that are going to call the police and say the guy down the road is a bit unstable because he's maybe selling some drugs or maybe he's just a bad character and I know he's got an illegal gun and I think you should go and take that gun from him. There aren't yeah. too many people that are going to do that because the moment they get found out snitching on somebody down the road, they're going to be in trouble by their peers. If that snitching doesn't work, now that person who was dangerous is coming after them. And again, he is the one that said homicides. He's the one that's now including all of these uh, th these elements that are basically the, 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 the tragedy of the streets, if you will. Yeah. And so now he's basically saying, look, we get these red flag laws, homicides are going to go down. I bet not because it's not how it works. You're right. And it's not, not what's contributing to it. Um, if I can just add one last thing on that. Absolutely. You know, and then I got to tie that back into the, to the domestic, but go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. Finish. I'm good. So yeah, I, I almost forgot. I was like, oh yeah, I was forgetting. I was weaving my way back there. Yeah. So the red flag laws, you know, I think that there is some truth that that a lot of people that are in abusive situations, they unfortunately will, you know, frequently make, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word excuses, but let's, you know, for lack of a better word, they'll make excuses, you know, and this is one of the reasons why people tend to stay with abusers because they, they kind of say, you know what, maybe I did deserve that, you know, you know, I actually, <sighs> he hit me because I didn't do the dishes correctly. And honestly, yeah, there was some, you know, the, the plate was dirty, right? So they rationalize some of the behavior from their abusers. So what is the likelihood that again, they're going to turn their abuser in and say, Hey, my abuser is abusing me and, um, has firearms. And I'm kind of, I kind of feel threatened. Some will, but I'm willing to bet similar to the streets that many will not for different reason. They'll rationalize while may, why maybe their abuser wouldn't go that far. They might rationalize why um, they deserved it. And so therefore, uh, you know, they're because a lot of women don't press charges, even when a domestic violence call is made, you know, by, by a neighbor or a friend. They unfortunately rationalize it. So I think what you're going to see is not much of a reduction with these with these red flag orders, but you will see some more violence kind of going back to the stabilizing brace where I said, hey, I think that violence will increase on one side of the equation, but not necessarily the other. I think you'll see a similar thing here where police will go out to take firearms from people and um, those people won't want their firearms taken and there'll be some, some conflict and there'll be some people shot. So you'll see that police will shoot, do some more shooting. I don't think you're going to see much of a reduction on the civilian side. You might see some, I mean, I don't think that if you had a national red flag law, you'll probably see <clears throat> some reduction, but it may be lost in the increase elsewhere. Com completely agree. Um, and in my my rambling a little bit ago i wasn't trying to um uh i guess victim blame would be the word um right right we want know, to be careful that, not to yeah that that's that's that wasn't that's not my intention with my with my my rambling um you know when it comes down to it it's like you have say you have a red flag order um there's been places where a spouse or a partner has called on a red flag order for the right. state to take their their partner's weapons and uh they stay with that partner right you know, it, I, the, the, that entire issue of domestic violence, domestic issues, um, 
it, it's it's tricky. It, it's full of full of thorns, and um, it is a mental health issue too. Because, and, and that's outside of the purview of government. I, I don't like like giving people the idea that they can just pick up the phone, they can call the court, they can get a red flag order put into place, and then that's going to make them safe. When really what they need to be doing, as maybe even in addition to it, is removing themselves from the situation. Uh, instead, we have an epidemic where they make excuses or they, they try to justify it somehow, like the plate was dirty. Or, you know, it could be the other way around. Oh, I'm sticking around for the kids or whatever. Right. Um, but anyhow, summing that up, it's really hard uh, uh, for me to look at any leader politician with a straight face when, when they want to talk about reducing crime, reducing, or excuse me, not crime, uh, violence mm -hmm. uh, or murders. And <clears throat> we have a, we have declared war, war on drugs. And that war has been declared on domestic citizens. Right. You can't expect to bring murders down when you literally have a war on your citizens. I yeah. mean, I want to stress this, like, so the number one thing he, you know, any politician, if you, if you eliminate the war on drugs deal, what do you think that's going to do to our murder rate? Right. I mean, not to be redundant here. You said that. So let me, let me point out to people here. We talk about drugs. I am a drug dealer. I deal drugs for a living. I am a legal drug dealer. Now, the patients that I have, you said that the government doesn't want people to have drugs. They want people to have government approved drugs. Right. Is what they want. Um, if someone comes in and robs my business or attempts to rob my business, and I have been robbed in my career, I've been robbed four times. We call the police, right? Call the cops. Right. right. And because I'm lawful and they can protect my business permit, they can protect my life and uh, whatever. If I am an illegal drug dealer and just say, besides all the negative connotations, just assume for a second, the only thing nefarious going on with my business that I'm selling drugs to people uh, is the fact that I don't have a permit and the drugs haven't been FDA approved. And I'm selling to people voluntarily who want to buy things from me. But then one day somebody comes to my business and robs me. I can't call anybody. I don't right. have any, I don't have any force. There's nothing to protect my business. So then it does right. turn into violence. So eliminating black markets in general would be a better way to go. Eliminating the war on drugs, red flag orders. I'm not down with this one. Right now it does. It does at least attempt to address the problem that he, uh, that he has identified at the very beginning. So I'll give him that much credit. At least he's attempting it, but I don't think that the evidence supports it. So right now we're at three that had nothing to do with what he initially said we need to resolve. We have one that does go in that direction that I think that there's a strong argument to say that it actually won't. He's got a fifth action item. So let's go ahead and listen to that fifth action item. Who knows this folks, this one might be the one. Fifth times so a charm. Let's see. Fifth time, yeah, fifth time's a charm. <laughs> Finally, the Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the key agency enforcing gun laws, hasn't had a permanent director since 2015. Today, I'm proud to nominate David Chipman to serve as a director of the AFT. David knows the AFT well. He served there for 25 years. And Vice President Harris and I believe he's the right person at this moment for this important agency. And I've said before, my job, the job of any president, is to protect the American people. Whether Congress acts or not, I'm going to use all the resources at my disposal as president to keep the American people safe from gun violence. But there's much more that Congress can do to help that effort. And they can do it right now. They've offered plenty of thoughts and prayers, members of Congress, but they've passed not a single new federal law to reduce gun violence. Enough prayers. Time for some action. All right. You know, he seems to have included actually three items in his final. So the first one was 
he's going to institute or, or put David Chipman uh, into the uh, a permanent director position for the AFT, uh, a, a position that has not had a permanent director since 2015. So again, just off the cuff, that's the first item. And it's not really clear how that actually like they didn't have a permanent director so gun violence has been crazy like i i don't really he didn't really make that connection there the second one was uh he he mentioned two different loopholes one was the charleston loophole which i'll talk about in just a moment and then the next one was the boyfriend or significant other loophole i think this is a little bit more uh, casual loophole that he's he's talking about and that's where basically hey if if I've had to get a restraining order against somebody, then maybe that person should also have, you know, if they have a gun, then they shouldn't be able to have a gun as, as well. Um, so I, let's go ahead and start with the AFT director, David Chipman. Um, are you down with that, Josh? Um, no. <laughs> oh, man. I wonder why. Uh, okay, Tough so. i proud here. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> this is a gentleman who, um, you know, he's, he's blatantly lied before, you know, particularly about Waco, where he tried to say that the Branch Davidian shot down FBI helicopters. Right. Uh, you know, somebody like this, uh, you know, he's going to be aggressive. Um, obviously, it, those of you who are aware of Waco and the people that were murdered, uh, I, I won't go into a big, long thing about that with David Koresh and the ATF and that big doggle that happened. Uh, it was absolutely terrible. It was a gross display of too much government power. Uh, David Chipman has no problem with exerting the, the muscles of the ATF on, on citizens. So that, that's, that's one thing that I, that does concern me. Um, no, the fact that the ATF didn't have, hasn't had a permanent director since 2015 has not stopped that unconstitutional agency from, uh, enacting a lot of gun control, um, through its, um, <clears throat> I guess you could call it, uh, discretion. It has broad discretion to do things that it probably shouldn't. I had a lot of friends of mine who became felons uh, through the bump stock ban and um, all those types of things that were enacted underneath Trump. I don't want people to think that just the Democrats are anti-gun. The Republicans are, too. It's just a lot um, more mild and a little more quiet about it, if you will. Right. Uh, but as far as David Chipman goes, uh, you know, he's a uh, he's a big government um He's a big government uh, control person. He really likes large government institutions. Right. And, uh, he's uh, he's got a long career of um, uh, bad things. So no, I'm not good with this guy. So let's ask a quick question. So you mentioned that he lied about um, whether or not the Branch Davidians had shot down air or shot at or shot down. I can't remember which one. A helicopter during the Waco incident many years ago. This lie was actually recent within the last couple of years. Yeah. So the question that we have to ask is, if he's going to be a permanent director position, after President Biden was talking about needing red flag laws, which are going to go and take firearms from people. So what happens, remind, remember people, this is what's going to happen. Somebody has to call a government agency and say, this person is a threat. I think that you may want to consider taking their firearms because they have a lot of guns and they're a threat in some way. So do we want a guy who has already lied about American citizens being in charge of any kind of system that is related to taking firearms from people on the basis that they might be a threat? Is it possible that he could exaggerate the threat? Is it possible that, and I, I know that people aren't gonna be calling him directly, but what I'm saying is, it's going to be a top-down organization where he says, these are the criteria, this is how, how things are going to operate, these are the circumstances under which we will get involved, so on and so forth. So if he's already lied about Americans, is that the guy that's really going to help us curb violence? Is the guy who has a picture of him practically standing over the smoldering bodies of, what was it, over 50 women and children? that they're responsible for their deaths, for, for basically a building being burned down when, during the Waco siege. Is that the guy that we really think is going to be the one to help curb the violence? Because it sounds to me like we're getting a violent guy already to come into an, uh, a position and say, this is the guy that's going to help curb violence elsewhere. 
In what way? It sounds very much like the wolf guarding the hen house. This is what's called a hammer, right? Um, you know, it's a hammer, hammer, meat, nail. It's, right. it's, everything he sees is a nail. Right. And, uh, not only is he violent, he's a liar. So we have a lying violent. There, there's no reason for anybody, even even someone who hasn't worked with the FBI or ATF for 30 years, uh, just you and me, uh, right. regular Joe Blow citizens. Uh, there's no reason for anybody not to know or understand what happened to Waco, right? Right. At, at this point in time. And, um, you know, even looking back, like what started the fire, I mean, it was a flashbang grenade. Mm -hmm. I remember watching that. Uh, well, I didn't remember, but I've looked back and I've seen the you know, Chuck Schumer doing the C-SPAN things where he's trying to convince everybody that the Davidians were the ones that caused the fire and that flashbangs don't cause fires. And, um, you know, there's been so many lies that were associated with Waco and what happened. Right. It, it was a very embarrassing uh, time for the ATF and the FBI. Uh, overall, they killed 82 people. Um, a lot of them were women and children. Mm -hmm. Um it was just a terrible thing. And then you have somebody like uh, Chipman who marginalizes that and then lies about it and says they, they shot down helicopters. And it was, he said they, that they shot it down. This is just a few years ago. That, that it's just, that's not true. I mean, right. Just, and, and, and maybe, maybe the American people like, okay, let's assume for a moment that, um, the, the, that we do need a permanent director. We need somebody to be in this position to kind of lead the charge. Right. Let's assume for a moment that that's a good idea. Would it not be better to maybe bring in like a top hostage negotiator, somebody whose job is 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 criticized if they lose a life, right? Like a hostage negotiator, their job is to get people out safely. And as far as I know, it's a personal point of pride when they have a record of I I um, I took this threat and I uh drawing a blank on the word that i want here but but i handled this particular situation and resolved it without any deaths that is a personal point of professional pride for hostage yes. negotiators why don't we why don't we look for people like that whose job is to keep people from being killed not somebody who might have been responsible for killing people and and, and we can even assume for a moment that Everybody that died in the, um, uh, you know, even I don't want to say we can. Even if we assume that everybody died during that that died during Waco, um, was not his fault, right? Even mm -hmm. if we assume that hey, things spiraled out of control and it really was the civilians and all the ATF and FBI and whoever else was there, all all of them were completely innocent. Even if we assume that, at the end of the day. They didn't manage to uh, to, re to 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 walk out of that situation with the fewest fewest deaths possible. No. So they failed, right? No. And and this is what we should be expecting out of our law enforcement. We should look at them and say, okay, if you killed somebody, you damn sure better have had no other choice. You should have been. I mean. Law enforcement tells us, I'm not anti-law enforcement, but they tell us all the time, our lives are on the line every single day. Okay, well then act like it. Act like your life is on the line so much that it, it's on the line to the point that, it's, that, that, that you're trying to reduce the deaths of other people. Because from what I'm seeing right now, yeah, maybe it's on the line, but it doesn't seem to be on the line so much that it prevents you from killing people because no. people get killed all the time. And I think that these kind of positions, they should never be held by anybody who um, who doesn't have a stellar record in uh, in in, in um, uh, I keep wanting to say the word destabilizing. That is not the word that I want. Uh, the word that I want is not coming to my brain. It's on the tip of my tongue. But we, we want people that um, have had great success in reducing death in an incident, in mm -hmm. taking an incident and um rather than letting it spiral out of control saying okay i'm going to use the the training that i've had i'm going to use all these skills that i have to get everybody out alive and we're, that's not who we're that's not who we're um we're, we're, we're bringing to the table and i think it's uh i think it's a problem and i think that kind of shows who the government really is you know this is the same entity that wants to lecture us about gun violence why don't you start with your own house 
well, well, absolutely well said, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the hostage negotiators, Th- those, um, you know, a lot of them, they do a great job across the country. It's a tough job. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when people get in those types of situations, unfortunately for Waco, uh, the hostage negotiators were, were given uh, a lot of grief. Uh, they went through several of them. Um, and th- there's a division in law enforcement, and this is a very general oversaying uh, over, right. over delay, is when you're approaching things like this, um, you see people who want to save the lives, and then you you have people who are this they're just an agent of force. It's like okay, right. there are criminals in there. We got to go take care of it. We got to do it right. now. Um, the only hostages at Waco uh, were everybody inside the building. It was the ATF and FBI that were holding them hostage. Right, right. I just I people need to understand that they were trying to reach out to the media. They were trying to get the press to talk to people because they weren't allowing very much communication to go on with the negotiator, even to the point where they put a big sheet outside the window of the thing. And, you know, we want the press, you know, right. they wanted it transparent, but uh, unfortunately we all saw how that ended. Uh, yeah. Chipman, like you said, a destable, you started to say destabilizing force. Um, you know, that's kind of long line of what I'm thinking too. He's an agent mm-hmm. of chaos. He's right. an agent of order and force from the state. He is going to enforce their boot is what he's going to do. And right. he has the tendency to lie and exaggerate. And I think it's a terrible pick for the ATF. Honestly, you know who I would pick for the ATF? I would pick Adam Kokish. <laughs> Caught me off guard there. <laughs> yeah, you know, he, he would abolish it right off the bat. Right, That's right. It. Right. Uh, and, and and I'm only hyper, I'm only saying if it were to be and the word I was looking for was de-escalating. We want de-escalate. people that have a good record of de-escalating these kind of situations because yeah. this is a national position. So there's no reason why we can't have such an extremely high bar and say, look, if you don't have we want the person with the best absolute record of de-escalating a situation. Mm-hmm. Not a person that has been involved in the situation having escalated. And it's not to say that that's necessarily against you. Again, maybe you were, you know, maybe somebody was involved in a situation where it did get out of control and it escalated and it's not their fault. I'm willing to accept that. That just means that you don't get that position because we want the best. This is America. I've said this over and over and over before. This is America. We're supposed to be the best. We should start acting like it. And that yep. means when you have one single position for the ATF director, it's one position for the whole country, the best, period. All right, so let's move on to this other two. So he was talking about this um, uh, this Charleston loophole, and he was talking about the boyfriend and girlfriend loophole. Um, I think the biggest problem, and I don't think there's a whole lot of conversation to be had on this this boyfriend girlfriend loophole. Basically, it's saying like if there's a restraining order, then we should take your guns away too. I think that's a bad idea because again, this violates due process. And the restraining order is saying, hey, maybe the guy is uh, has been a a peeping tom, right? Mm-hmm. And he might get a restraining order saying, like, look, we caught you looking through the girl's window, uh, you know, a couple of times, and she reported you. We caught you. And so now she has put out a restraining order on you saying you cannot be within, you know, 100 feet of her house, something like that. I don't know, 500 feet of the house, whatever the case may be. Right. Yeah. Is that does that really warrant taking his firearms away? He was just a pervert. Right. In some cases, you might make that argument. But the problem is a restraining order doesn't is not always issued on the explicit basis of violence necessarily. It yeah. can be issued for any number of other reasons. And just because somebody may be threatening doesn't mean that they're actually going to take it toward violence. So I might, I don't want to use me, a, a, per, a, a guy might actually say, maybe, I, like I've known girls, I'll put it this way, I'll, I'll actually tell you a real story. So I knew a girl and she had dated a guy and he would um, sometimes come to the house at night in the street and just peel out on his car and take off. That was it, right? That's the extent of the harassment that he did, you know, for whatever reason. It was yeah. stupid. Now, if he had firearms and uh, and she called and said, hey, you know, I've got video footage of him out there. He's squealing his tires and then taking off. It's a little bit intimidating. I don't feel safe in my own home. So then they say, OK, you can't come down that block anymore, for for instance. Right. Um, they put out a restraining order. on him. I don't think that's sufficient to say that he actually was going to go from that to actually uh, real violence. So it's yeah. not a guarantee. And that's the problem that I have with it, because it skips due process entirely. And what it does is 
it doesn't put any limitations <clears throat> or <clears throat> it doesn't put any kind of limitations on get a restraining order. Mm -hmm. So a restraining order at that point could be easy to get, it could be hard to get, we don't really know. And so as long as one has been received, it becomes a bit of a back door to take somebody's guns away but you, because you could just go get a restraining order and it comes with this added uh this addition of we're going to take your guns so i think it's a bad loophole to try to close and if you want to deal with violence of boyfriend girlfriend then i think what you need to do is you need to identify who is actually going to be violent first and you have to have some really credible information that says this, if they've been violent before, okay, that might be a conversation that we should have. Hey, if this guy beat up a girl, his girlfriend, and she had to get a restraining order, there might be a reason then to take his guns away, maybe, you know? And I would be more sympathetic to that particular argument because it's very, very specific and indirect. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I would like to just see consistency because, I mean, obviously, like, even though I'm pro-gun, I, I know there's people who should not have firearms. Right. You, you know, I, so, like, the guy you said, like, is pilling out. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, maybe that person would escalate. You know, you don't right. really know. However, I, I don't like the general statement because, like, you could violate due process. It could take too far. You can get a restraining order for on right. somebody for almost anything. Um, I would be okay if this um, if this was tied into like if the restraining order was uh, from something that the person had already broken some law like they if there, there's a peeping Tom, you've been on my property. Right. Right. So you've trespassed. So, you know, I, I could see an argument with saying, OK, this person has already shown the capacity to violate the law, squilling tires, saying hurtful things. Yeah, I mean, they could be a nuisance, but they're not really violating you per se. Right. Uh, now, the and there's no violence. guarantee of actual violence. Exactly. Now, the the because um, we should be allowed to disagree and to, you know, say things to people. And now, right. the stalking and things, there's a lot of nuance to every single situation. I don't think a blanket state, you know, position like this from the federal level is the way to go. I, I think on these kind of events, most of them it seems like uh, law enforcement handles adequately. Right. You know, um, you know, but I, I don't like the, the general thing. Cause like you get a restraining order against anybody, somebody watching the show can get a restraining order against me. I don't want this guy 500 feet near my house. Right. I don't even yeah. know the person. And are you going to come take my firearms now because right. of that? You know, right. So, you know, I know that takes it to the extreme. It does. But the point but, here that we're making is for, for, for anybody watching is that, a, a um a restraining order does not is it it's it's not issued on necessarily the basis that future violence is likely to happen that's yeah. not always the reason why a restraining order is given Correct. so therefore it should not come with this added uh notion that you can take the firearms from somebody yeah he um I agree 100%. It creates one loophole while closing another one, if you will. It's like, okay, we're going to close this boyfriend girlfriend loophole and we're going to create this due process loophole where we don't have to go through due process in some situations where it absolutely should have. And actually, due process should always be, um, we, we should always be uh, ut utilizing due process. I've, I've heard so, a lot of law enforcement officers like high up, particularly when it comes to terrorism, they talk about how. Uh, due process it oftentimes is a uh, is a burden on the state, right? Um, and well, good. It, well, that, Should be that, that's right, and, and that's why, like, I, 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 some of the people I've talked to about it, I'm like, that's supposed to be the point. <clears throat> you, you know, there has right. to be a safeguard against uh, the state in some manner, particularly when it comes to criminality of things. And due process is all that we have. So even though. It might be a subject I don't particularly like or care for. Maybe somebody's right. on trial for something like Casey Anthony, for example. Let me just use her because we all aware of her here in Florida. We know that she's still walking around here somewhere. Um, due process had to be followed. It has to be followed every time for every person because if not, if we don't hold that standard for each other, we mm -hmm. all lose. We lose due process. Right. And even though this may close one loophole, it creates a another loophole for abuse by your fellow citizen and for the state. And I don't like it. Right.
So let's talk about that Charleston loophole. So according to the NRA, and I know a lot of libertarians aren't really big fans of the NRA, but they point out that the Charleston loophole <clears throat> would not justify lengthening the three-day provision, which is what President Biden was talking about. He was saying, hey, we need longer than three days uh, before somebody can buy a firearm. So here's the details that the NRA points out. It comes in four points. I'm going to read this from their website. One, the Charleston murder, uh, murderer first attempted to buy a firearm on April 11th, 2015, but was delayed due to an arrest for drug possession. Okay. So, he, so he's delayed already. <clears throat> the gun was then transferred to him on April 16th. So it's five days after his attempt. So already he's exceeded the three days. Yep. The attack, however, didn't occur until June 17th. So over two months after the murderer first tried to buy the firearm. During that time, the FBI continued to investigate to determine whether the transaction should have proceeded. The FBI investigation was not impeded because the firearm was transferred. So even though he still got the gun, the FBI was still looking into this. When it was later determined that a transaction should have been denied, the case was referred to the ATF for recovery of the firearm. That didn't happen in this particular case because the murderer was not prohibited from possessing a firearm due to his drug arrest. So here's why. Under federal law, a person has to be an, unlaw an unlawful user of a controlled substance, so the government needs evidence of use, not simply possession, of a controlled substance. So the federal courts generally require evidence of a, quote, re recent and repetitive, end quote, drug use to sustain a conviction as an unlawful user. One court even held that the evidence of a single recent usage of drugs by the defendant was insufficient to sustain a conviction. So in other words, just lengthening the time would not have stopped it. No. It might have it might have prevented him in one area getting a firearm, but because the event happened two months later, there were still other avenues that he might have been able to to get it. And because uh, because he was not considered an unlawful user, because apparently he had only been convicted of possessing the drugs, that wouldn't have actually been enough to keep him from getting a firearm. So it's again, one of those situations where we have a tragedy, we come out and we say, well, we need to do this because this totally would have stopped this. And when we look into the details of the matter, we find out that it actually would not have prevented it. So no. wrapping that up, we got three things. We've got David Chipman, who probably should not be in any way whatsoever leading any agency because he is not uh, known to have de-escalation skills, which is what we should want. Then we have this boyfriend-girlfriend loophole, which uh, would basically trade one loophole for another because we're creating a loophole for due process. And then this Charleston loophole, which, okay, you can call it a loophole, but it doesn't look like that extending the time frame would have done anything to prevent him or the 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 shooting as well mm -hmm. so any further thoughts on that josh i just want to point out let other people will just say no like the, the three days that's always been a contention uh mm -hmm. about you know the waiting period or the cooling off period there's also the background checks you know i, I believe that I, I don't have an issue with a background check per se um you know if taken to the the extreme of liberty, then I'd say only people who are committing crimes should be uh, have their their weapons removed from them. Right. Um, but the uh, th let's just go for example to to uh, what's the word um, compromise. Okay, mm -hmm. we we have background checks. The government needs to do them in a reasonable amount of time. Okay. Right. You know, I because I, if not, it just becomes another barrier to purchase. Um, right here in Florida, you're supposed to be able to walk in if you have a concealed carry permit. You've already gone through all the background checks and everything. Uh, you should be able to go in and purchase right away. Well, right. the state system has been so backlogged that um, the last time I purchased a gun a few months ago, it was like six, seven days I had to wait. And I have a concealed right. carry permit. So I, the reason why, like he goes in to try to get it done, you know, it was five days. They hadn't got it done a reasonable amount of time. They should have, and they let him go. I would have focused on, let's see, like if I'm doing executive orders, how can I clean that up? 
-hmm. How can I make the background check system more efficient? How right, can I right. get, if there is a problem, how can I get that into the hands of the authorities faster? And the only way you can do that is if you revamp the system. It shouldn't take three, five, seven days to run a background check on somebody when you already have supposedly this national firearms database. If, you know, if you're not addressing that problem, it just looks like you're trying to add more delay or more barriers into firearm ownership. Right. So now let me ask, I just want to make sure, because he, he spit off a lot of things on this last point, DL. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to talk about the gun show loophole with this Charleston loophole? Or uh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, talk about, talk about whatever you want. Um, uh, I'm going to step away for just a second, but I have my headset on. I am okay. still listening, folks. I, I just, I just, I just want to clarify because everybody always talks about this, this gun show loophole. And um, it talks about, you know, you could just go to a gun show and a person can just purchase whatever they want. That's, that's really grossly misleading. See, to most of the people that go, that are at gun shows, they're, they're federal licensed firearms dealers. Now, you'll have a few people in there who will sell privately, uh, but that's not the majority of people in gun shows. So most people who go to a gun show to purchase a firearm, you absolutely go through a background check. That's just not true. Uh, what this does appear to be doing is, and they've been trying to do this for a while, is target private sales. So whether if you're at a gun show or if you're, you know, your neighbor comes over and you're like, hey, you know, I got all these guns and stuff and you want to sell one to your neighbor, uh, you actually would have to engage and have a background check and you'd have to go through all these things, um, you know, and the taxes and everything is associated with it. So more so than the, they're using the gun show scary thing as if thinking that people are going to buy in all these guns without, uh, uh, you know, getting background check. Really what the, I believe the intent with that is, is to target private sales. At the end of the day, the federal government wants to know where every weapon is, who has it, you know, at all times. Uh, so private sales and even gifting, they've looked at that too. So you got to do background checks on that. So, you know, I, I just want to be clear so everybody knows the gun show loophole is not that big of a deal. Uh, once again, you can't, how many, all of this stuff that he's mentioned so far, DL, he still has yet to mention how this is going to affect his 316 people are shot a day and 106 people die. You know, I, I don't you know the Charleston. He mentioned the Charleston. Maybe that guy would have done it. The only thing I could see that could have prevented that is maybe if the, uh, uh, the system itself was cleaner, he got the background check through faster, denied it faster. He wouldn't have even had the firearm in his hand. And I, I lay that at the foot, feet of the government for not enforcing and uh, the things that are already on the books the way that they should be. Right. You know, and you know, regular and listener, a, oh, go ahead. Got a federal agency that hasn't had a director for six years. I mean, why? I mean, not right. that they should do this to begin with, but since they do, the entity should run appropriately. If it doesn't have a chief executive officer running it for six years, who's dropping the ball here? <laughs> right. <laughs> Come on. You know, and anyway. I think it's, you know, I think it's one thing uh, we, we should point out that regular listeners of the show we know we, we normally do a um a bill review which we're not doing this time around because we're talking kind of about they're not really bills but uh same context you know some authoritative document that's coming out from the government saying this is what um you know what we're going to do and this is what the citizens are going to be subject to so it's very very similar in that sense and um when we look at bills the first thing that we look at is what are you trying to accomplish what is your evidence and uh, how much is it going to cost? What's what's the impact of it going to be? So on and so forth. Right. So we, so we look at these kind of criteria and we just went through. And we said, OK, he's got five actions. The fifth one actually was like a, a conglomerate of three actions, but he had five actions. So the first one, ghost guns, something that's not been a problem. So so this action is not going to address the gun violence that he keeps talking about. Then the second one was gun trafficking, which they don't even have a handle on. And it's also not something that's reported in these stories and saying, hey, you know, this person went out and killed a bunch of people because of gun trafficking. So since they don't know how how prevalent it is there, uh, you can basically say it's not really going to contribute to the uh, to resolving the problem because you don't know how much of a part of the problem that it actually is. And then three, the stabilizing brace. The stabilizing brace, 
it's just going to make it, uh, you know, so that people that are using a firearm can't be as accurate. But again, this is not typically something that we see as part of the gun violence problem. Four was the red flag laws, the EPOs. You know, we went over that and talked about his homicide, uh, you know, the issues with the homicide and how the drug war plays into that and how the drug war is probably playing a large role in the homicides. And so that if you in, in that the likelihood that regular um, everyday people who uh, I don't want to say everyday people, but people that are not mass shooters, but are, who, who are still killing other people are likely not to be called on uh, by their fellow citizens for a red flag order. Nobody's going to snitch on the drug dealer down the road and say, hey, man, I think this guy's a threat to people. And then fifthly, we've got this uh, David Chipman, who doesn't have a record of de-escalation. Um, in fact, he has quite the opposite record of being you know, part of a, um, an agency that has uh, contributed to escalation and has lied about the situation. So where in here is any evidence that any of this is needed has uh, has any likelihood of reducing the gun violence. And then on top of all that, when they talk about gun violence, they only want to talk about the gun violence that is committed by civilians. And they mm -hmm. want to include all gun violence. So that would be violence that, because any shooting of one person to another, any, any shooting of a person is gun violence. Some of it has uh, is warranted, some of it is not. Some of it is justified, some of it is not. So they're not delineating between justified and unjustified gun violence, and that is a problem. So as far as I can tell, um, I'm saying no to every one of these because I think that none of these are going to benefit the American people anyway, but they will make it difficult on many people. And um, in some ways, they'll make it even worse because they'll create this sense of false security saying, oh, look, the administration has done this thing. Gun violence is now down. So now people will be less vigilant. I think this is a bad thing. Yeah, it's a bad thing. And, and, and you know, you, they could play with statistics a lot and, and make things look like they're down too. Right. You know, so, you know, just like you said, in summary, you know, all these executive orders, that, that they don't really do anything to address the initial problem he identified. And um, even while we were going over, we talked about a few things that they probably could do. Right. Uh, they might that might actually address the situation um, with by not adding anything new to the books, just actually enforcing or cleaning up and streamlining some of the things we already have. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's going to be a wrap. That's all for this show. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button and to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head on over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media network where the weekly episode of just me, airs Monday night at 10 p.m. Or join Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion-style episode of the same topic. While you're there, be sure to check out some of the other free speech media shows. There's some really good ones there. I'd say all of them are really good. Yeah. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty, have a great week. Catch you next time. And we're out. <laughs>